Okay, we're back online uh, now with uh, Adi Benawi, um, one of our guest speakers. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of uh, Applied uh, Blockchain. He's had a long experience. Applied Blockchain has been in the market since uh, 2015. Has, he's, has had a long experience in uh, financial services as well as in multinationals and telco. Uh, but I believe that the best person to, to introduce himself will be uh, Addy. Addy, thank you very much for your, for your time and we're looking forward to hearing from you. No, it's great. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. So um, we'd like to ask Diogo to start sharing the presentation if uh, all, all things are moving well. So Addy, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, Diego, next slide, please. Um, hi, so my name is Adi Benari. I'm doing CEO of a company called Applied Blockchain. Um, we, as, as we said, we were founded in 2015. Um, we, we build blockchain applications for clients, for customers. Um, we've worked with a few companies, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, and we're also developing two. Uh, one is called Silent Data. It's a way for getting data from outside of the blockchain to be verified and used by applications inside the blockchain. Uh, and London Bridge is a bridge connecting uh, um, tokens and applications on one blockchain with those in another. So we're developing products kind of on the edge. Uh, and then the solutions that we develop for clients are general purpose blockchain applications, um, NFT marketplaces, decentralized finance protocols, uh, and so on. Uh, I'll explain and talk to uh, some of these technologies in a minute. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of customers, we spent probably the first three years working with uh, large corporates. So we worked initially with banks who were the first ones to explore blockchain. Um, in particular, we went through the Techstars program with Barclays. Um, and then we started working with different industries. Uh, the biggest uh, customer that we have now and the biggest relationship is Shell. Uh, Shell uh, commissioned us to build the next generation uh, energy trading platform, a derivatives trading platform, uh, which is used to reconcile, to capture and record initially inside the company. Um, today, this is used to capture, uh, I'd say, pro probably around half of the company's uh, trades across the entire group. Strategic application, uh, and it's, um, it's been used in production since 2018. Uh, the other companies we've worked with, Toyota, KLM, uh, Stita, Lloyd's Register, uh, some of the telecoms companies and so on. Most of those were experimental blockchain uh, projects. And then we've worked with a whole range of startups uh, and different types of ventures, uh, all building new types of applications. Uh, initially, for, for a, uh, proof of concepts and, and private blockchain applications, but in the last two or three years, much more uh, production, uh, crypto, uh, and public blockchain based uh, applications. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, this is some of the, uh, the team. This is really the, the, uh, the, the people you can see here, the original team in London. We set up in London in 2015, um, but actually we opened an office in Porto in, in 20, and that is now by far our biggest uh, part of the team. Uh, we actually have 65 uh, out of, we're a team of almost 100 now. We have 65 of those people in uh, in, in Porto. Um, last week I was in San Jao. By the way, what an amazing, amazing uh, festival. Uh, so we are in love with Porto. Uh, we have an office in uh, Batala, the square. Um, and uh, and this, is, uh, this is where most of the company operates now. Next slide, please. Okay, so back to the blockchain. Uh, I know you've had a few, you've had some other blockchain lectures and, and Thing. So I'm going to try not to repeat what other people say, but I'm going to give you my version of the world. Uh, so first of all, the only thing blockchain is useful for is assets. Right? It's basically a more secure way uh, to store who owns what. And the reason we say it's more secure is because there's more people looking after it. Does that really make it more secure? It depends who those people are. Right? Uh, in the public blockchain world, uh, there's lots of them and they're anonymous, so we don't know who they are. But just the fact that there's lots of them and they're incentivized through a reward system means that we, we think this is quite trustworthy. 
And, and if we have one company looking after all the assets, well, maybe they're a well-managed company and all their employees are very honest. So maybe that's better. Um, it's relative, right? There isn't, a, there isn't one true thing. Yeah, but in general, I think it's accepted uh, that if you have a group securing something of value, then it's, going, it, it's, it's less likely to be uh, corrupted or stolen or changed than uh, if it's sitting inside one place. Uh, so the main the main value there is if we look after records of ownership and and generally what we own is assets. So I do on blockchain that isn't related to assets probably shouldn't be there. Next slide, please. Uh, we split those assets today largely into two types of assets. We have the fungible assets, which are things that look like money and commodities because they one one and more they're all the same. They're interchangeable. And then next slide, please. We have non-fungible tokens, um, and I understand that you've been told all about these. Uh, these are unique assets, and uh, we, we've had an ex explosion in the art and music world and so on, where these are used to represent uh, individual works by different creators. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to run quite quickly through uh, just the NFT slides that I have here already, because the subject here is DeFi's and DAOs. Um, uh, what I really wanted to illustrate here was we have NFT marketplaces like OpenSea and they represent uh, non-custodial solutions, which means that the users have the assets in there controlled by their wallets and the marketplace doesn't control the assets. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an example of a wallet. It's a Metamask, which is the most popular wallet on Ethereum. The reason why it's really important to think about these uh, the um, non-custodial market is because the users have control of their own assets uh, and the way they exchange is through a smart contract. The smart contract is acting effectively as an escrow. So you have some, a, a program that runs on the blockchain. One party puts their asset into that uh, contract. The other party puts their money in and the constant release the, the, the asset to the, to the buyer until the money until the money is there it doesn't release the asset the, the money to the seller uh, till, again unless both items are there so the contract acts as the escrow uh, in this process and that's completely automated and it's completely independent of any of the parties so they don't need to know and trust each other that in itself is a is a kind of trust an automated trust bridge which demonstrates the efficiency of the blockchain because you have the payment and you have delivery and they happen together and they can happen with parties who don't know or trust each other. And they, 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 all they need to do is essentially they trust the technology to execute as it says it will, as it's designed to. So that really is the foundation of the efficiency of the blockchain, um, the ability to pay and, and to exchange assets in, in one transaction uh, and in a safe way. And everything else that we'll talk about is really built on top of that. Next slide, please. Um, by the way, I forgot to say this is interactive, so please uh, interrupt me with any questions. Uh, feel free. It's much more fun when it's interactive. Uh, uh, an example that we give uh, with the NFT side is a, a project we were in, which was artwork by, by the artist Damien Hurst. He's a big artist in the UK, uh, well established. These are physical works that had digital uh, NFTs associated with them. Um, and after a year, which we're coming up to that end of year this month, if you own an NFT, you can ask for the physical art and the NFT will be burnt. If you don't ask for the physical art, the physical art that's in the, in the vault gets burnt. You stay with the NFT. So we don't know what people are going to stay with. It's an interesting experiment, but it also shows the interaction between the physical world and the, and the digital. Next slide. Have you seen, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a good, uh, a very good point which is, um, it's what I call, I don't want to call it manichaeist, but it's, uh, it's and or, uh, an and or situation. But you could always have a hybrid situation where you'd, you'd actually buy the NFT and the physical art or the physical object and keep both of them. Um, you just, uh, when you buy the, the you were saying no. Not on this project. Not on, not, that project. Not on this yes. project. But yeah. The project actually illustrates something very important, which is if the if the NFT is representing the right to the physical item, then only one of them can be traded at any one time. 
right? So if the, if the NFT can be traded and bought and sold, the physical has to be locked up somewhere, right? And probably looked after by a custodian. Because whoever buys the, the digital, the NFT, needs to know that they can make a claim on the physical. If both can be traded in parallel, then it's meaningless. The digital doesn't represent the physical anymore. I understand. I understand. Uh, here no. is uh, much more like um, if, if you have uh, the physical... Well, first of all, uh, as you know, NFTs have the ability to to program commissions to the to the transaction. So uh, yes. an owner, an original owner, would actually keep on getting royalties or getting a kind of commission, which which would be a way of uh, compensating the original owner. That's one thing, which which makes all the sense to actually act. I don't want to say burn or destroy the physical uh, asset, but mm -hmm. actually to have it in a in a in a, a third party custodian that will will uh, only return or, or will only provide the physical asset if uh, a, a the correct key is delivered to that uh, third party custodian but that's that's, that's a, correct, a, a yes. different model yeah yeah but, uh, and in general it's not it's it's the creator that gets that gets rewarded rather than an owner because the owner when they sell the nft they're effectively not the owner anymore mm -hmm. right True. Uh, so yeah. it's usually it's, it's usually a way of continuously uh, rewarding the creators. In the case of the Damien Hurst uh, project, the, the the initial artwork was sold for twenty million dollars, which was a uh, normal for that type of art for Damien Hurst. And since then, it's been almost a year. There've been eighty ninety million dollars worth of secondary market sales, mm -hmm. right? And the and the artist obviously has a on the marketplace has a percentage of that in their fees which is completely new revenue that they, they would never have collected previously. Yeah, but the, the, the question is, you have, you have two things here. One is, if I acquire the, the piece, I will burn the, the, the NFT, or if I, keep the, yeah. the, if I keep it, that piece of art will, will have to disappear. And that's, that's the question, yes. uh, which is... Uh, correct, uh, correct. Which is so it's, it's, it's happening now, it, it, it's happening now, right? It's happening this month. Uh, and, and all these all these physical artworks will be burnt. So far, out of ten thousand pieces, one thousand five hundred, I think, as of yesterday, were already claimed. The physical was claimed. The rest are still NFTs. But yeah, at the end, you will have other, right? And uh, yeah, and the NFTs will it's no longer be redeemable. Yeah, I think it's a great experiment yeah. for two things. One is is to to see where the where where is the potential value. So if if there's massive a massive trend towards digital, then the potential value is there. If there's if on the other side, uh, if um, if people really want the artwork, the physical artwork, then it's it's going to be a, a good uh, a good perspective. Yeah. It yeah for for me it demonstrates quite a few things that are unique to this technology, right? Um, one is the everything actually is the liquidity. Right, because as soon as these NFTs went on sale, they were the original sale was for two thousand dollars. As soon as they went on sale, within two weeks they went up to seventy thousand for one. Right, and this was because people all over the world were buying, selling, buying, selling, trading them. Right, like mm -hmm. stocks. You couldn't do that with art before. Right, you have to go yeah. to the gallery. You have to. Say, yeah, it's a nice piece. I'll have the package and pay for it. Right, and take it. Yeah. Now this is this thing is spinning. Right, it's spinning yeah. all over the world. And that spinning is only possible because it's, you can digitally trade the item. Uh, so that's one. It's obviously open global markets. Um, and, the, and the second thing is, is, is was what you said about the commission to the artist. Because the result of that spinning, there's a commission there which goes back to the original creator. Which again, after selling the first time, the original is, uh, he's out of the, the financial uh, loop. Right? He's no longer involved mm -hmm. in the transactions. So yeah. th th those are really the two new novelties here. So we have already a question yeah. here uh, by someone. We, we haven't uh, got to DeFi that... or DAOs yet, but okay. Yeah, well, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's how these webinars go. That's my fault. So who acts as custodian <laughs> over, the, over the physical good then? That's, that was the question. From yeah, so, yeah, so in this case, we have a company which uh, represents the artist and they manage the sale. Uh, they actually manage the host of secondary as well. Uh, and they, they have a, a custodial function. 
right, which mm-hmm. has insurance and has a, a you know it's, it's a, it's a custodial uh, service. And if you turn up, and I'm going there next week with my passport and my NFT, a physical piece, mm-hmm. hopefully. Yeah, hopefully it's there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's move on a lot. Actually, next slide. Next slide. Okay, uh, just uh, very quickly. So we talked about NFTs, a uh, fungible, uh, fungible, non-fungible tokens. So a very prominent uh, token that, that that we we get involved in a lot in the project is USDC. USDC is what we call a stable coin. Unlike some stable coins that have been in the news, this one is actually backed by by money. Right, so there's money that sits in the bank. There's U.S. dollars that sit in the bank of a company called Circle here. Uh, there's already, I think, something like it's probably more like 50 billion in circulation. Uh, and actually, we as a company, half of our revenue, half of our invoices, uh, get paid, uh, receive them in USDC. Right, so mm-hmm. we get paid companies all over the world. They'll pay us in, in U.S. dollars. We're not exposed to any cryptocurrencies. Right, this is it's a U.S. dollar tied uh, back token. So it converts, uh, and our accountants treat it as a as a bank account. Anyway, next next slide. Um, next one. I'm just aware of time. <laughs> uh, okay, we're getting on to DeFi. So uh, Uniswap is a is is a very interesting protocol. Actually, can I go back one slide? Oh, I've made things complicated for Diego. There we go. Uh, Okay, this is a, another crop, another a type of stable coin. Unlike the one that the USDC, which is backed by dollars, this one is backed by all sorts of things, right? Other cryptocurrencies, some real world assets. So there's a basket of different assets, which all uh, uh, are managed to be at a, at, a, at a stable value relative to the dollar. And then there are dollars which are issued against those assets. Uh, so this is a, a completely different model. Um, those of you who follow the space a little bit will be aware of a stablecoin called Terra, which completely uh, collapsed and brought down much of the market with it. Uh, we wrote a very interesting report in January. Uh, we were commissioned by a fund to put a lot of money into the Terra protocol. They asked us to write a report and we described to them, amongst other things, how the protocol could collapse and the risks. And we, we did describe exactly what happened in the end. So if anyone's interested, we can share that report. Uh, but anyway, it's an example of actually a much more uh, stable uh, and well-run coin. Next slide, please. Um, so Uniswap is a, a smart contract protocol, which is a bit similar to what I described with the NFT before, where somebody puts their money in on one side uh, to buy and the seller puts their NFT, their asset in on the other side, and the smart contract in the middle wait for its booth and then releases to the other side. A bit like the lawyers do when you buy a house, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but this is completely automated and autonomous. So Uniswap does a bit more than that. It basically collects pools of assets, uh, and it will collect pairs of them. So there could be the US dollar uh, token on one side, and then there could be uh, a cryptocurrency project. Uh, on the other side, right? So you have two different tokens, and effectively you have pools of pairs. And uh, if I want to come along and I have US dollar token, and I want to change that for the project token, I'll go to the Uniswap pr- protocol. Uniswap token will have the pool, and it will take one token and give me the other one, right? The exchange rate that the project me is based on its the size of its pools, and it has uh, universal put their assets into the pools in order to get the, of the commission as well. Now, all of this uh, maybe doesn't sound too spectacular, except that it's all completely, completely automated and autonomous. So there's nobody running this protocol. There's nobody, uh, there's somebody who wrote the original code, put it onto the blockchain, and since then it's just built up literally hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, uh, of, of, of value going through this system. Uh, and building up in its pools of, uh, of, of assets. Um, so it's a, it's a tremendous example of just uh, something that's super efficient because the cost of actually providing this service is almost zero, right? There, there is a well, code that's out there that's doing something that would otherwise need a lot of, uh, sorry, go on. Uh, well, there's, um, 
I I totally see what what you're saying, but uh, on the other side, mm -hmm. um, obviously you have to to a certain extent hedge uh, a, a pool that is very large uh, or a pool that is uh, minuscule. So, yeah. um, how, and and the question is, how does Uniswap manages the ability to 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 actually have that kind of uh, pool for almost everything? And that's, uh, yeah. that's so yeah. so so this is it so it has it has a it, it's code right the code has some rules in it it has some algorithms um and the algorithms basically incentivize if a pool is getting empty then one asset gets very cheap another asset gets very expensive and it, and it makes it and, and it makes it uh, sorry just being interrupted uh, it, uh, it 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 basically incentivizes in, in, incentivizes investors to populate the pool which isn't which where, which isn't sufficiently populated mm -hmm. uh, through higher fees for that asset. So it basically automatically balances through an incentives mechanism, which is again completely automated and part of the rules of the um, of, of the protocol. Okay. So how would you sense? define that business model? Well, it, it does from, from an operational standpoint to make sure that you have enough, uh, that the pool is large enough to compensate the other pool in the case of a swap yeah. or in the case of a trade. But uh, how would you define this, this business model sustainable in the long run? Because... Uh, um, yeah. So, so first of all, the, the, the algorithm, the way smart contracts work is you make up the rules and then you deploy them. And then that's mm -hmm. it, you them, right? Because the, the promise is for people who are putting their assets in that this is how it works and that nobody can start manipulating it, right? So, so basically, all, the, all these people hosting the blockchain are basically guaranteeing that these rules are not changing, right? That whatever code was, is set out, that's it. That's what's going to happen to your asset. So these are generally uh, well-designed and well-thought-out from the start, and they need to deal with these types of situations. Uniswap has, has been a relatively good example. They've been through, I think, over four years now. They've been through three releases. That's it, and and it's it's served a very very large audience with very large sums and and generally functioned well. Uh, Terra was an example where actually it got off balance, and and then it, it and then it and then it completely completely collapsed. Uh, but if you looked at the rules as we did, and you look at and you analyze the risks, then you can you can see this, right? And so if there's gaps. Uh, you know the protocols rely on people monitoring them, taking opportunities, being rewarded for taking those opportunities, ar arbitrage opportunities, and so on, uh, happening. So this is how they're designed. But they're designed yeah. to be completely autonomous. There isn't somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings and saying, "Oh, we need a bit more of this. We need a bit more of that." Or maybe I've got a lot over there. I'm going to change things. You know, none of that can happen. It can't happen technically. Yeah, one one good question that's coming from the audience is, is uh, why aren't you using non-stable cryptos in the sense that your most of the uh, most of your transactions are on USDC, right, or a stable? We as a company. Yeah. Yeah, I have to pay the team in Porto in euros. Yes, I know that. I know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't yeah, take. So. They don't take crypto. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so you'd say that you still have to have this uh, physical world connection to to make the payment, but uh, I think that the yeah, the, but also the to, question is provocative to, to honest, enough to yeah. to say that uh, uh, if if you trust so much the blockchain, why wouldn't you yeah. uh, at least have some kind of investment on non uh, non yeah. asset backed uh, crypto? Yeah, so I, I, I love the efficiencies of the blockchain. I, I think the, the, the texts are what makes this technology interesting. right? And I think that's what, it's what will ultimately make the technology transformational. Right? I think it hasn't even started yet. Right? I think we haven't, we haven't even started. What we're seeing now is a bit of fun and games and, and a lot of nonsense. Right? I think we haven't started. But ultimately, the, the technology is, is very efficient. And unless it's which is even more efficient, then I think we will see it permeating permeating into different uh, areas of business and life um, um, but uh, that's not to say uh, we as a business need or should be exposed to the speculative activities around these cryptocurrencies 
right? You know, we run a responsible business. So yeah. I want to get paid by my customers and I want to pay my employees. I don't need to be uh, exposed to, to, to the risks of the of, of the market the of people buying and yeah. selling these tokens. These tokens. Yeah. That's, a, yeah, that's a different area yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And to be honest, I've never uh, said that I understand the prices. Right? I understand mm-hmm. the technology. I understand that I can, we can build it. I understand how it works. But why it should be two dollars not one dollar that's i'll leave i'll leave that to the traders yeah <laughs> okay good good stuff let's uh let's move on then okay so the next slide please uh, okay this was an example of, a, of, an, of another liquidity pool if we go to the next slide it explains it in a bit more detail um here we have two assets uh, in in one of these pools so you can see asset A, I'm not going to count them, but we have a lot more of asset A than asset B. That Im- it, Basically, it's implying that asset B is worth more, right? I think asset B here is worth something like four asset A, like that. Uh, so you can see how many are held in the pool and the implied price. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, now, the way the uh, uh, or part of the algorithm is that it has this uh, function which uh, derives the price based on the reserves of the assets, right? And it's basically the quantity of asset one, which you see is X here, times the quantity of asset two equals uh, um, uh, the, 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 the total, uh, um, hang on, I've lost my thread here. Uh, yeah, basically the part the, the, the of the reserves has to remain constant. So one times the other, it has to remain the same value when we take take something out or put something into the pool. I'll demonstrate that on the next slide. Okay. So is is what you're saying? Uh, you're locking a price when transact. Obviously, you're locking the price when the, the transaction is happening, right? Correct. 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 So now now you can see this is what I described before. There's effectively four A's is worth one B, right? So one A is worth a quarter B. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you time if you multi pools in terms of quantity, you get 100 times 25 is 2,500. All right, next slide, please. Okay, let's, uh, let's try and follow this, right? I'll try not to get confused myself. So if I want to buy 1A, how many B do I have? Well, if we take 1A out, we go from 100 to 99. And if we times that by 25, we go to 2475. We need the quantity is back up to 2,700. All right, so if we go to the next slide, yeah, that's going to be the two five, right? Point two five. So, so, so that's that's the ratio. We basically gave one. If we buy one A, we have to give point two five B, and mm-hmm. the rate is driven by whatever it takes to to keep the product of the two quantities constant. Okay. Next slide. This is just one model, by the way, but it's proven to be a successful model that's very very simple. And, and that allows this whole process to be automated in a very, very efficient way. Um, so here we're buying 1B, and then the amount of A that we have to sell, 4.2. Again, because if you look at the uh, product of the two uh, quantities at the bottom, that's what it takes to you take 1B out to keep the, con- the, 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 the product of the quantities 2,500. Slide, please. Um, here's an example what if we take a very big out. Next slide. And uh, you can see it's not taken a, a proportional chunk out of B. Uh, next slide. Um, and to make it a bit more complex, we also have what we call pool tokens, which when in, in, um, we, we have market makers or investors are encouraged to leave their assets here. And they receive mm-hmm. pool tokens in return for doing that. Those tokens give them a portion of a pool, of the overall value of the pool. It's like a share. Uh, and they can come back and redeem those. And as the pool, uh, as the protocol functions and uh, these transactions happen, the people who are exchanging their assets, so swapping A for B, they pay a small fee. And when they pay that small fee, the, 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 the value of the pool grows with the fee that's collected. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the pool, the investors 
when they pull that, when they re, when they redeem their tokens, when they come back tokens and, and take out their funds, they will also get back their portion of the profit, which was made from the fees by the pool. Okay, and it's basically a proportion that's relative to the the proportion of pool tokens that they hold. All right. The next slide, please. Yeah, I'm not going to go through all the all the examples, but yeah, keep going. Next slide. Um, but overall, that's 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 frustrated that with very very simple mechanics, you can have something very powerful where you have, uh, in this case, a, a, an investor putting their money in, and you have people who are able to exchange uh, different types of assets, uh, all in a completely automated way, in a way that the pricing is is automated, the rewards given to the investors are automated, and so on, and, and the balancing is maintained. Uh, an extension of that, uh, which is really, these are the two things that really f uh, defined DeFi uh, when, it f when, when, it, when it exploded in the last 18 months. There's the swaps protocols like Uniswap and Tiny Man I just described. And then we have the lending protocols, right? Lending protocol, this is the example of Aave. Aave is a lending protocol where it, it's, it's, it's quite similar to the swaps, but the idea is that somebody can come along and instead of giving one asset and, 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 re, and receiving another one. So instead of swapping, they give the first asset and they leave that in the protocol as collateral. Mm -hmm. And then they borrow the second asset. Right? When they borrow the second asset, they use it, then they return it, they repay. When they repay their, their loan, they repay with interest. And then they, they get back the, uh, the, the original asset that they left there as, a, as collateral, right? as a deposit. So it's a protocol that enables lent borrowing, right? And on the other side, we have investors, just like we had with the swaps, and they deposit their tokens used for lending. And that interest that's paid by the borrowers, that goes into the pool. And so, a bit like with the swaps, when investors pull their money out, they also get a share of the profit. Okay? So it's a crypto-backed lending system. That's, that's what we're saying, right? It's not... It, yeah, but the fact that it's crypto, I mean, the, the, the tokens could represent anything, right? These could be dollars and euros, right? What the tokens represent isn't the point here, right? The point is the mechanics, right? What you have here is a mini bank, right? You have borrowing, lending, investment, interest, yeah? You have all of that activity all being run by a piece of code which isn't controlled by anybody. Right? Yeah, it's completely and that, autonomous, and that leads yeah. to to regulation, uh, which is well. Um, that, that's a that's a yeah. that's a different that's a different subject. But I, I just want to focus on the technical efficiency, because what you have here is the is a, effectively a mini bank, right? And, exactly, and it's a mini and bank which you which, which you can trust without a third party. Yeah, right? I, which doesn't I, involve I, any third party. Yeah, yeah. I understand. I understand completely where you're coming from. Uh, the, from yeah. a position from a bank is that banks have to invest so much in regulation and to in AML KYC and all these uh, new uh, let's call it directives, uh, be it PSD two, MIFID, uh, and so on. Perfect. That um, the code the code in itself it's competing with the bank, uh, and it's it's much more efficient than any possible bank ever. So, yeah. so, so there look, has to be. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. What, what, I, what I would do. So, I, I worked for a bank before I started the company, right? For one of the big four UK retail banks, right? What I would say is split this into different compartments, right? Of course, there is a there is a, a huge amount and a growing amount of regulation that the banks have to adhere to, right? And a lot of this regulation will, over time, be applied the, in the in the crypto and blockchain space, right? But inside the bank is a huge amount of inefficiency. Huge, right? I worked at a bank. We had 1960s uh, IBM mainframe systems, right? This is what most large companies are built on, not just banks. Right? If you go inside most big old companies, that's what runs them, right? That's where your balance is sitting. It's sitting on a mainframe, yeah? It's, it's the, 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 the inefficiency and the, the, the technology layers and... and on top of the technology, all of the bureaucracy is, is, is huge. 
Now, of course, some of that is attributed to regulation. And I think there will be, when it comes to crypto, there'll be much more efficient ways to deal with the regulation as well. Yeah. But a lot of it is just pure, pure inefficiency, right? You have, uh, and you have a single institution which is responsible for all of this. The bank I worked at spent one billion pounds a year on cybersecurity. Right? This protocol, and that's just to put walls around its mainframe systems and the other systems, right? So people wouldn't come in. This platform that I showed you, how much does it spend on cybersecurity? Yeah. No firewall. Yeah, I don't want to go. Yeah, I don't no want to go network over administrator. The issues of zero, zero, and, okay. and, and hacking, uh, hacking uh, blockchain systems. I, but okay, uh, I mean, I can no, no. But these, these things, I can I can take you through, right? Because we work with a lot of different blockchain. We work with blockchains that don't fork. We work with blockchains that are very performant. There's, you know, it, like I said, it's very early. These these reasons for they 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 they're changing, right? It's like saying yeah. no to. It's like saying no to. Uh, what are they here today? To, mo to mobile phones because they're big, chunky boxes that sit in cars and in 1980. And so no, people are not going to be able to walk around with them. You know, the technology problems get solved very, very quickly. Of course. Right? I, the regulation I, problems I, I, will take longer. Hmm. Yeah. And, and here comes a good one because uh, here comes a good question that relates to, to what you were saying. So what was wrong in Terra algorithmic rules? Okay, so um, I have someone in my team who wrote a report and really has the, the, the real detail in it, and I'm happy, happy to share it afterwards. Um, but at a very high level, uh, Terra had quite a few different parts of the system, but the main part of it was a lending protocol, right? a bit like Aave that I described. And so there was, um, uh, there was an investment on one side where people put their money in to the Terra protocol, it was actually to the anchor uh, protocol within Terra, and they get twenty. They get twenty percent uh, interest. Okay, now this twenty percent interest is crazy, right? And so people put their money in, and they thought, I get, I get twenty percent guaranteed, it's free money, right? So lots of people came to this. So we had lots of investors, and the pool became very, very big, right? The problem was that there wasn't enough borrowing, and people weren't paying interest on the borrowing to take the twenty percent, right? And in the beginning, it was okay. They found other sources uh, of, of, of income, like that was small, but because twenty percent attracted billions and billions <laughs> and so many people, it just became unsustainable, right? And it and it started tipping, and the value of of the Terra stablecoin was basically uh, uh, anchored in in the the borrowing and lending protocol activity, right? And so once that started tipping, then the, the, the underlying for the stable coin wasn't balanced anymore. And so the, the, the stable coin started becoming less stable. Uh, the Terra Foundation started to put in, they, ju they just put money in one side that was coming out as interest on the other. So it became like a Ponzi scheme. Because there wasn't enough lending and uh, borrowing activity, they just started feeding money in that was then going out at the 20%. So if you looked at this, you could see it, right? It's all transparent. Yeah, the rules were transparent. The, the flows of funds were transparent. But most people didn't bother looking. They just looked at the 20% number on the website. Exactly. Yeah, that's what that's I tell probably why we need uh, regulation. Most, most of the small investors, if, if you really want to, if you really want to invest, at least you have to take a look at the, the white paper and understand what's going on there. So yeah. that's I mean, again, the beauty of the technology is, is it is transparent. Uh, the, the tragedy is that people for and therefore we're probably going to need regulation just to guide people because they're not going to know what to look for yeah okay great let's let's move on then because uh i'm not sure if you're going to finish all the slides but um but let's uh but it's good interaction okay no good we, we, i think the main ones uh, next please uh, okay, so just to, to tie together the NFT and DeFi, where, where this comes together nicely is um, as people were trading these NFTs uh, with each other, uh, they started to connect to these DeFi pools. So people would come along with a CryptoPunk, which they, which, which they bought for $200,000, which is a history of trading at that value. And then they bring it into this liquidity pool and they say, right, can I borrow $200,000 worth of coins? Uh, and the protocol could automatically check 
confirm the value of the asset of the NFT and then lend on, lend uh, proportionally on that basis. Yeah. Uh, so that's how the two things started coming together as well, and we started having lending and, and DeFi around NFT assets. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the, the the real interesting thing here, I think, that you need to that I, that I would focus on is don't think about NFTs as just cartoons. Think about them as any type of asset, right? Any asset that can be where a digital registration of the asset can be used to trade, and 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 then think yeah. about the lending that can automatically be applied to it, right? Remember, this is just like games at the beginning, but but think about the, all the different assets that we have that are traded in the world that can be brought to this, these types of efficient systems. Uh, and it's not just efficient, it's com- composable as well. We have the, the DeFi, the swaps, the lending and borrowing all on top of these assets. They all plug into each other. It's what we call the composability. Mm-hmm. Next slide, please. Uh, Opulus is an example of a project that we that we built for a client, which is a, a marketplace for musicians, which combines all of these. So the musician creates a uh, a token, uh, which represents a song. Uh, the, the fans, the music fans, can invest in that. Uh, they can effectively buy a piece of it, and when that music song gets played on YouTube, on Spotify, and the money comes in from those sources, it gets distributed to the to the fans or a portion gets distributed to the fans. But the musician in the beginning, if they're not getting enough money from the fans, they can they can borrow. So they can take their song NFT uh, or token and they can put it in a DeFi protocol and, and investors can, in, can lend the money to them, which will then come back. When the money comes back from Spotify and YouTube later, it will go, it will be rooted automatically to the lenders first. Mm-hmm. And only then uh, after the debt is paid back, then it comes to the artist. So this is like an example of an ecosystem where we can take those things that we talked about before, the, the, the DeFi lending and the, um, the, and the automated uh, smart contract mechanisms and just apply it to, completely to an, an asset, which in this case is the music song IP. Okay. Uh, this, by the way, is classed as a security and it's treated as a security uh, because the, the, re- the revenues and the future revenues of the IP our distribution of, uh, of income of revenue to those investors. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a so as well as developing applications, we also develop products. So I talked about a, I mentioned Silent Data, which is a product that we have for linking data from the real world with these uh, protocols on the blockchain. So we have, for example, in Silent Data, we integrated with open banking. So we can prove that, that somebody with a wallet with the crypto wallet is the owner of a bank account. We can even prove that they have certain level of funds in their account, maybe more than 100 euros, but we won't know how much they have in their account. We can do these privacy preserving queries and prove the outcome of the query to a, a, a contract on the blockchain, which can verify this seeing the data and then act accordingly, maybe release tokens, lend, etc. Uh, so this is what we're, this is how we're kind of integrating uh, what we call Web2 or uh, existing data sources that are out there, existing systems with ap- automated applications of value and uh, DeFi applications on the blockchain. So uh, and by the way, the asset, z- uh, yep. zero knowledge proof, yep. uh, zero knowledge proof solutions, right? So, zero knowledge proof is one. Yeah, we use different types of cryptography, different types of, uh, of cryptographic technology. Zero knowledge proof is one class that we use. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, Invoices I've given as an example because that's an asset class which is relatively popular to begin with to convert from a real world asset and to tokenize it. Uh, so in this example, we integrate with invoicing systems. We integrated with an invoicing financing company, and we can take the invoices, which in their case are verified invoices, create tokens, and prove that those tokens represent invoices in the real world. Prove the link to the accounting system where they were retrieved prove that the company is registered and, and linked to the company's registration details and so on. So we can prove all of these different things about the data in the outside world and, we, and they can be verified in a token on the blockchain even without the data being on the blockchain. Okay. Okay. And so it's more, it, yep. it, j- yep. uh, just a question just to, to make sure that I've, I, yes. I've, I've got this product. So this is more of an Oracle based product rather than a factoring alternative solution is that it 
Uh, correct. The, the, uh, correct. The product that we build is an oracle. It's used for, for many different types of data sources, but it keeps the data private and outside the blockchain. Mm -hmm. But it allows us, and, and this is how we believe things should be. The blockchain is a stick ledger. It's not public. Usually the data is shared between the parties uh, or can be seen by the parties. So we don't think data should be put on the blockchain. Right? But mm -hmm. we think you should be able to check and verify things about data on the blockchain. Yeah. Because maybe you don't want to lend to someone who hasn't been through a KYC process. Maybe you don't want to buy an asset that, that hasn't got certain proof about its origins, about its properties, about its uh, risk, and so on, from outside data sources. So you can verify that those things are true and that they exist and they're within certain ranges. Um, and you can do that actually seeing the data. Right? It can be done in an automated way on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And that's Great. that's how we bring the, the we bring these efficiencies and the trust from these uh, the contracts and DeFi linking it to the outside world as well. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Next slide. Um, uh, we use. Uh, uh, I won't go into the. Probably we don't have time. But this is one of the technologies we use is from Intel. Uh, another product that we have is a token bridge. Uh, we were linking initially Algorand and Ethereum, and we have some special uh, security paradigms and, and technologies that we're using to make this more secure. Uh, again, if you follow the space, you might notice that bridges have been like the source of uh, a big source of, excuse me, of, of hacks and compromises uh, and theft. And it's because people get obsessed about the blockchains themselves and how secure they are. But again, a lot of people don't bother checking the transition uh, mechanisms for moving from one blockchain to another. And the bridges previously have not been very secure. And now the, we're, we're part of building a new generation of bridges which are much more secure. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I promised to talk about DAOs as well. So the way, the, way, the way I look at DAOs, and if I'm honest, we haven't really been involved in many yet. Uh, the way we look at DAOs is, is basically allowing token holders, which are usually people, uh, to use the fact that they hold tokens as a basis for voting. And those votes are collected in the smart contract and they're used to drive the decisions in the smart contract. Um, and an example is, a, is a, it could be a fund where lots of different people pull their funds into, uh, into a smart contract. So they, they send their tokens in. And the smart contract will only release the funds to, um, to to certain individuals or projects or companies investment, if you like, if the the, the voters vote in favor of this. Um, and so it's really allowing token holders to drive the logic that's in the in those contracts in order to move the assets. Yeah. Um, Wouldn't now, you? Yep. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't you see DAOs as uh, as an opportunity for for a specific integration of uh, DeFi and and voting rights, which would actually help building new business models? For instance, uh, actually, uh, and lately we've been discussing about uh, the the Veer currency, which is the the Swiss uh, uh, secondary currency, which which actually. Uh, improves liquidity for SMEs, and and you could actually inject uh, special voting rights to to these kind of of uh, token holders, which in itself will will generate a business model that helps SMEs in this case. Right. I mean, personally, I haven't seen, I haven't come across really great examples of those. And, and the, 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 the problem I have with them at the moment is I see them as a sort I see the voting as a, as a source of inefficiency, right? Mm -hmm. Because if everything that made the, the, those uh, autonomous, the fact that those previous contracts I talked about were autonomous, that's really what made them work so quickly and cheaply and took all the friction out. The, if we introduce now people have to vote, that does add, that does add a level of friction. And I'd question, would, you know, what yeah, the that's value that's is. a great point. And wouldn't you see autonomous voting as the next step for DAO, for DAOs? So you'd actually uh, configure your your position on the DAO as an automated voting yeah. right. So you don't actually your your position has to be automated. Otherwise, the DAO will will, will, mm -hmm. will stop, as you said. Yeah, yeah, potentially. 
But again, when I look at projects, a lot of projects have tried to um, decentralize themselves, right? Remove the central party that maybe set them up from having too much control, right? And they and they and they could use a DAO to, to to facilitate that. But behind these accounts are people, right? And what happens is, is you might have a million different uh, token holders, but there's probably twenty that are actually really active on the project and maybe own mo most of the tokens, and they're the ones that are actually uh, pushing most of the, the agenda and voting for it, right? And the rest are not mm -hmm. very active. So you end up with something that's actually quite similar to shareholding, right? Yeah. It's not, I, from what I've seen so far, it's it, in practice, it, it, because it, it backs down into the human behavior, you, you kind of end up with a very similar model, right? Well, that's what we've seen so far. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I, I kind of haven't, uh, I, I think it, it's it's basically a way of bringing the human element back into the process. Uh, there will be situations where I think that uh, that will be effective and interesting, uh, but in general, I, I'm you know we, we haven't really seen, seen the opposite. We've seen you know uh, just uh, the way, like I said, uh, well, yeah. non non crypto DAOs for me the, the 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 most successful non crypto DAO was was actually called the Mondragon experiment, which was a, a cooperative system uh, after World War mm -hmm. II, where people just didn't have the the liquidity to buy and sell, so they would trade. Uh, so they started building cooperatives for, for actually an industrial area of, of Spain, uh, in, in this case, the area of Mondragon, which actually um, ramped up the economy because of that, because of the ability yeah. to generate uh, liquidity when, when the voters or when the stakeholders didn't have it. So I think uh, we need to probably pull these examples from, uh, from physical to crypto and, yep. uh, and use them. Yeah, I, I think uh, the idea of pooling, of, of having these autonomous vehicles to pool liquidity and then have some agenda, you know, maybe predefined agenda for how that liquidity is, is distributed. That that's super interesting. That's it, it, we might be coming down to semantics, but that's not necessarily a DAO, right? What what for me makes it a DAO is if it kind of pauses to get the votes from the account holders. <laughs> well, I <laughs> which, I, which may, I see which maybe yeah. I see yeah. DAOs as a as a, a step uh, a next step to it, which is you really need to automate. Um, uh, you need to you need to define what are the what you'd call the strategic decisions and the operational decisions. And the operational decisions yeah. have to be automated. So, yeah. so strategic decisions have, have like shareholders. Uh, so, yeah. so that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, I agree. Okay, great. Let's move on then. We're almost. Uh, I'm not. Let me just check because we've been so. Uh, we. I have a, another question here. Could you provide a practical example of uh, how a bank could use today your blockchain solution? Uh, that's a, that's a long that, that's that, a long that, answer. That, 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 <laughs> no, no. The, the question is the, is the other way around, right? How how, how can Blockbuster use uh, streaming, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's designed to distribute boxes of videos of DVDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my claim is the other way around. If I was a bank, I would say, okay. Put the existing organization over here, take a blank sheet of paper, start drawing with this new technology and offer the same services that you offer today and see what it looks like, right? Yeah. Now, you're, of course, you'll, you'll say that you'll say, okay, there's regulation, right? Which is true, right? So you probably can't use this technology today in the same way because of regulation. But at least you, you, you start to have an idea of how this technology c could impact the industry in the coming years in countries where the regulation will start becoming more more adapted to allow for it and i, and I think it will because it will it will enable efficiencies and economies that yeah. enable efficiencies you know gain over time yep yeah i think uh you mentioned something which is really uh, paradigmatic which is the the the, the um, uh, video rental versus streaming um and and if we use the the, the example of, of blockbuster uh, mm -hmm. there's an asset which was not leveraged against Netflix, uh, which was the customer base. They had a, a, an unbelievable yeah. customer base. They had very little knowledge about the customer, but uh, because they assumed that the customer really wanted to go to the shops, which they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> it proved out yeah. that they didn't. Um, the, the, but the fact that they owned that 
piece of gold and they were not able to transform it, that could be a lesson to any bank that has a, that piece of gold. They have so many clients, so they just need to, to understand better what the clients are really asking for. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this, this is all, you know, if, if it does materialize this way, then I think it's a transition. I think it will take many years. It's a complicated technology. Uh, you know, even if we don't touch on the, on, on, the, on the regulatory aspects and the risks there, consumers, you know, yes, we have a, a base now of people who, you know, young people who spent COVID time trading crypto and NFTs. So we have a lot more people who are now a generation that's a bit more comfortable with some of this technology, but we have a, most of the population which isn't. The technology isn't easy to use, right? It's, it's incredibly uh, complex and unfriendly at the moment in its current form. Uh, that, that there's a long way to go there's some big opportunities uh, and then, yeah like i said so, it's really, I think so it's really just the beginning. other than the yep. other than the user interface where do you see the opportunities for a bank because obviously starting from yep. a blank sheet, sheet of paper is 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 tough for a bank especially because yep. you have to kill your own babies let's let's put it this way yep. the two um, yeah i i think i think you have to re reimagine I mean, you go through all of that and then reimagine the industry, right? And what we see, we already see two two roles, which are potentially, uh, if you know, could be either existing players or new players, and they're already emerging. One is custody. Right? I talked about people uh, having their own wallets and controlling their assets, but most people like the idea of that, but don't really want to do it because <laughs> they'll probably lose them. Uh, certainly, when it gets to bigger amounts, and institutions mm -hmm. certainly want to want to be able to manage these very carefully. So we're already seeing a whole range of companies rising and becoming providing custodial services for initially crypto, but it will really be anything blockchain based, any blockchain based assets. The second thing that we're seeing is sta the stable coins that I mentioned. So a company like Circle is starting to look more and more like a bank. Right? They hold their, their holding funds of customers in, in what is a, a regular bank account. And then they're issuing these tokens onto the blockchain. Um, and they're KYCing their customers, they're allowing people in and out, uh, so they're offering some kind of exchange service. Uh, they also offer now a savings product and so on. So this bridge to, uh, to fiat-based uh, token, uh, tokens mm -hmm. uh, is something which I, th I think in the US we're probably going to see Circle regulated. Circle has already announced a digital euro Mm -hmm. right? a, 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 an equivalent of CDBC in Europe. Uh, there is a race with uh, central banks. Central banks are also exploring this. Uh, personally, I think, I think that in the, the free world economies, I think that the, it, it probably makes more sense to let companies, just like we have banks today, uh, it probably makes sense to have regulated entities providing the service rather than necessarily a central bank providing technical infrastructure. Uh, and so I think companies like Circle is, is really a huge opportunity. It's already a multi-billion dollar company. And I think banks will, will either offer this type of service or companies like Circle will pop up uh, and, and do it for them. Uh, but th those are the two areas that I think, ex you know, opportunities for, for existing players to already jump into this space. Uh, yeah, the space. Yeah, you mentioned- side, yeah. You mentioned something interesting, which was uh, the fact that uh, banks could, could actually leverage their custodial capabilities to to get into the space uh, to yep. a certain extent the beginning of regulation in Germany was a little bit about that and then they backtracked a bit because uh, it's the same as saying only banks can can do crypto custody so it's not as enticing for a, a let's call it a nationality or, or a country to yep. to actually provide those those services how would you, and this is a very important question for the Portuguese market, because uh, the way I see it is presently the, the government, as well as, as any stakeholder in the, the ecosystem, they really want to attract investors like, like, you, like your company. What would be the, 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 let's call it the environment or the context conditions or context uh, uh, background to support companies to, to come yeah. and invest? further in Portugal? Um, I mean, f Portugal already, the, you know, the reason we're in Portugal is the talent, right? Um, it's, it's, yeah, but the talent yeah. is, is, is the first reason. I'd say the second reason is, is just is probably the culture and the trust. I can say that as a founder, w without 
like being Portuguese or really having much association with the country, I felt comfortable and safe doing business mm -hmm. in Portugal. Right? And I can't say that even about all countries in Europe. Right? Okay. So, so it's, it's, there, there is something in the environment, uh, which I think uh, um, uh, is, is positive. Um, and then I think it's, uh, then if I think about this space in particular, uh, I think that the, the stable coins uh, are probably like probably the biggest enabler to bring this technology into regular businesses because we're a regular business. The stable coin issue is like circle. We're relatively easy to regulate because you just have to regulate their reserve, right? To make sure they, 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 they their tokens are backed, right? And that's a relatively easy thing to regulate. And then, you know, we as a, as a UK registered company for the UK entity, we have a circle account. It has a USDC. As I said, the invoices get paid into that amount. There's no reason why we couldn't pay the employees that way as well, right? And we wouldn't have any exposure to crypto. We would just be doing various things very cheaply and efficiently in terms of payments, and it would be instant. Mm -hmm. So that, that and, and then if you lay, if you start layering smart contracts on top of that to do some some of the business logic to match invoices, maybe to do something with the employment or even offer employees some kind of borrowing opportunity. Uh, you know, you could the, the, the imagination's a limit. We could take all the shares in the company and tokenize those, give those to the employees, and then they can borrow against them, against their options, and and it's all you know. You can start to put all this stuff together. If you've got a country that really backs a stablecoin, you know, it could be issued by multiple parties. It just needs to be regulated. I think mm -hmm. that's a that, that's that's a huge enabler. That's a, a game changer. Yeah, I agree with yes. you. Well, uh, I think we were way past uh, way past the hour. I just wanted to uh, thank you again and, and challenge you because uh, these webinars, as you know, is they're a precursor for uh, a executive blockchain um, program from Porto Business School, and we always invite all the speakers to become member uh, mentors uh, or members of the mentor uh, pool. Uh, so far, everybody said yes, of course. Um, obviously, the, the purpose is for any student that has a new business model that, that wants to, and, and especially we try to match the mentors with the, with the students or with the projects in this case. Mm -hmm. So any student that has a good project that wants to be mentored by someone that has actually is in the space and that can actually provide a lot of value, that's, uh, that's yeah. uh, very, very good for, for any student or project. So. You're invited, and uh, thank you again for. 100 oh, uh, percent. I'd love. I'd love to be involved. Yes, and um, this is good. This is good news for for all the prospects and students that are uh, applying to the to the to the program. And thanks again for your time and for your uh, great insights. And uh, thanks, uh, thank you everyone for for attending. This has been a really good uh, conversation and a really good presentation. And Adi, thanks again for your for your great presentation. Thank you, guys. Great. It's a pleasure. Hope it was useful.